morning. It's great to see everybody here this morning. Are you awake? I see some of you folks are like, I'm not sure. You just showed up here, Your Honor. <laughs> How'd that happen? Bag on the end. That's the end of the And if you are sleeping, they come up behind you, cack you on the top of the head wake you up.
way back to your seat. Have the worship team make your way back up here. Think about the worship. Let us pray. Grace everywhere may abound. Let us pray. morning. I love those old hymns like that. I think many of our churches, we've gotten away from them completely. And our church, we try to do half and half because not everything that's old is good and not everything that's new is good. Uh, they kind of get a good mixture of the songs. And But I always enjoy it when we sing the songs. I remember growing up uh, singing. So hopefully you feel the same way. Uh, as we go to the Lord today in prayer, let's just remember a couple things in particular. Of course, pray for our president, pray for our Congress. Pray for our soldiers who are in harm's way. Sometimes we can forget that that's still going on in different parts of the world. People that are putting their life on the line for our freedoms. So make sure we pray for them and their families. And then I'd like to ask also that we pray for a church that are hurting. Uh, many times the person you're sitting next to, you have no idea the burden that they're carrying. They walk in with a smile on their face and so everything's perfectly fine. And even if you ask them, they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm doing good. But you don't know what's going on. And uh, just pray for one another. It's so, so vitally important in this day and age that we do that. So let's pray for one another, and then let's pray that we have a good service today. Amen? Amen. Let the songs that are sung prepare your heart for the most important time of the service, and that is the preaching of the Word of God. Amen. And so let's be praying for that as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for so many that are here in your house. Lord, I know that many are carrying heavy burdens, Lord, some of which I'm privy to, others not. But, Lord, I'm so thankful and grateful, Lord, that they are here today. Lord, be with those of our church family unable to be here. Lord, also, once again, many that are sick and unable to be here. Lord, may you bless our church family. May you strengthen us, even in these most trying of times. Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, your grace that you show us, but also that you show our nation. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for the those that are serving in the military that are in different parts of the world and peacekeeping operations, as well as those that are here laboring in uh, armed forces or in the reserves. Lord, I pray that you'd watch over them, be with their families as well. Be with our president, be with our Congress, be with the judges of our land. May they make decisions and pass laws that allow us greater freedom and not restriction of freedom. And so, Lord, we give these things to your care. Thank you, dear Lord, for this time we have to Open up your word in just a few moments. May the songs that we are singing remind us of our faith, remind us of our responsibility to send the light into this dark world. May we make a difference in all things that we say and do. May you watch over the service today. Let everything be done for your honor, for your glory. In thy precious son's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 We're going to go ahead and remain standing. We'll remain standing as we sing this next song, Rescue the Perishing. Oh, 
great singing. We're going to go ahead and sing our last song, Mighty to Say. And you may be seated. You can take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Have the children be dismissed to go to children's church. All those that are sixth grade and below can go to either primary church or junior church, or they can sit in here with you, parents. Either way is just fine. I don't believe the church should take the place of parenting. I believe that's your job, not the church's job. I think it's one of those things that's hurt our churches over the years. Uh, but the time we provide that, so the kids can hear the word of God on their level as well. So you make that decision. Usually I start off with a joke or something today. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you a little trivia. How about that? My kids tell me I'm the master of useless facts. Any of the dads that are like this? You, huh? Yeah, my, <laughs> my kids will say that. When I say something, uh, I'll say, did you know that? And they will say, Dad, that's one of your useless facts. And I'm like, I just used it. <laughs> Sorry about that. John Hunt used that one, so it's not working. John <laughs> and I have been going back and forth all day today. You know that a cough releases an explosive charge of air that moves up to speeds of 60 miles an hour. 
You look impressed. You'll use that someday. A human being loses an average of 40 to 100 strands of hair per day. Yes. Most of us replace it. Some of you not so much. The average human being drinks about 16,000 gallons of water in their lifetime. Beards are the fastest growing hairs on the human body. If the average man never trimmed his beard, it would grow to nearly 30 feet long in his lifetime. Every person has a unique tongue, like your thumb, your tongue also. I'm glad they choose to use your thumb instead of your tongue. Every time you lick a stamp, you're consuming one-tenth of a calorie. The human body sheds about 600,000 particles of sin, uh, skin per hour. Maybe sin as well. That's about 1.5 pounds a year of particles of skin. By the age of 70, the average person will have lost 105 pounds of skin. Think about that next time you stay in a hotel room. <laughs> oh, they clean it, though. Don't worry about it. They clean it. <laughs> the human body has enough fat to produce seven bars of soap. For me, that would be conservative as seven pounds, seven bars of soap. This one I love, the last one here. The average human being... A little eats or takes in approximately 200 bugs per year. That's one pound of insects that you digest. Hey, hang on. Some of them are consumed in your sleep. Hmm. How many of you are thankful you use a CPAP? <laughs> I keep my mouth shut. Thank you very much. Oh, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at starting a new series, actually. The series we're starting on is basically just considered godly living. I am very concerned that in our churches we have done away with the idea of sanctified living, done away with the idea of convictions or standards about anything. It starts from the pulpit where pastors are no longer holding themselves accountable before God, and even church people are not holding their pastor, pastor accountable. And so you have sinfulness many times it comes out of the pulpit or in the pastor's daily lives, and it filters down then to the individual members and leaderships of our churches. I still believe in convictions and standards. You say, what do you mean? I think Curtis Hudson said it best. He said, there are things that I will die for. There are things that I'll fight for, but I won't die for. There are things that I won't, I won't uh, fight for, but I'll fuss over. And then there's some things that aren't worth fussing over. But I still believe in that first part, there are things that are worth dying for. Those convictions are the things that we say, no, before God, if I do those things, it's a sin. I will not cross that line. You say, what's a standard? A standard is simply setting a, a rule for yourself so you don't cross into that conviction that God says no about for you. So standards are simply red flags that go off when you're drawing too close to something that's sinful or something the Lord has led in your life to put away. And I do believe in godly living. So we're going to look at the idea of salt this week. And, of course, then the uh, other bookend, we're going to take a look at how we are light in this world as well. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13, the Bible says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost, have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? He's saying, well, how can it be salted again once it's been expended? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. He literally is saying it's only useful to gain traction that's lost any of its purpose original purpose, whether it be for the purifying of meats or whether that be for seasoning, whatever its case may be, it's no longer good for anything other than to throw out on a footpath. You ever think, how could salt be valuable? Do you take it for granted? Let me give you some statistics here. 40 million tons are required each year 
to fill our needs, 40 million tons. Our body contains four ounces of salt, just as you sit there. Without enough salt, your muscles will not contract, your blood will not circulate properly, and food won't digest as it should, and the heart struggles to beat. Do you know that thousands of Napoleon's army died in the Soviet Union, in Russia, during their retreat because they could not heal, their wounds would not heal because of the lack of salt. Roman soldiers years and years ago would be paid oftentimes not only by money but also by salt. They would give the Roman soldiers salt as part of their wages. You ever heard the term he's not worth his salt? That's where that term comes from. If a soldier was not what he should be, then he wasn't worth his salt. Now, looking back on this once again, we see the Bible says, ye, ye are the salt of the earth. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Ye are the salt of the earth. When the Lord looks at each and every one of us, he asks us to be salt in this world. Once again, one of the things that concerns me is we have lost the ability in our churches, but also, can I say, in our individual Christian lives. We've gotten too close to the world and seen how close we can get without ever crossing over. That is not the Lord's intent for us. All God's people said, stay with me here, okay? I don't want to fall asleep either. <laughs> Ye are the salt of the earth. Number one, if you're going on the back of your bulletin, we have a worksheet there. Number one, we are to be salt. Once again, what does Jesus say? Ye are the salt of the earth. It's not optional. Those of us that accepted Christ as our Savior... He expects us to be salt in this world. I love going back to the Old Testament many times to confirm things that are late, that are said in the New Testament. Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2, verse number 13. The Lord is giving a encouragement of something that they must do in regards to their sacrifices. He says, in every oblation, that means offering or prayer, every oblation. Is there another slide there, brother, I think? Shalt thou season with salt, neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings, thou shalt offer salt. You realize what he was saying? Isn't that kind of strange? You ever see that before? This was a new one as I was researching this. I thought to myself, the Lord says every sacrifice they would bring in the temple had to have salt along with it. And once again, that's because I believe the Old Testament is pointing forward to the New Testament that ye, me, we are the salt of the earth. Every one of us, we ought to be salt. One theologian put it this way, it is the Lord's intent for us to make a difference in this world, to expose sinfulness by righteous living, to slow the process of mankind's sinful disposition, to purify this world through the day-to-day -day exposition of a changed life. Ye are the salt of the earth. Letter A here, God intends for us to be different. God intends for us to be different. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 9 Peter writes this, he says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now I want to draw your attention to the idea, he says, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, not just a priest, but a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. We ought to make a difference by being salt. But then he says a peculiar people. Now, this gets confusing, especially to Baptists. So I'm going to go slow here. <laughs> he
he does not mean strange or weird. You ever met those Christians? I'm looking at some of them right now. <laughs> some Christians, I'm afraid, they think their goal of the Word of God is to make you weird. Well, when the world sees us, they ought to see that we're different. That doesn't always mean Christian. So what do you mean? I've met people who wear their clothes backwards. Obviously, that doesn't seem weird to you. It was really weird to me. Huh? My favorite bumper sticker of all time is, you are someone else's weirdo. You ever look at somebody and go, man, look at that weirdo. <laughs> somebody looks at you the same way and go, man, look at that weirdo. You ever go to Walmart late at night? There's some weird ducks in there, man. <laughs> They're a fry, few fries short of a Happy Meal. A couple quarts low, man. Their elevator don't quite make it to the top. Huh? Go there. I remember one time I was going there to pick up some medicine for the kids. I'm looking around thinking, man, these people are weird. Wait a minute, I'm here. <laughs> Somebody else is going, look at that dude, he's weird. Uh, peculiar doesn't mean weird. If that's the case, once again, we could be to Amish. I know some churches are right close to that. And I just told you, I believe in convictions and standards, but it does not call us to be weirdos or to go against the grind of the culture simply because we're going to be special. I do believe that what he means here, taking all of this as a whole, is those that are saved ought to become salt in this world. Our life, our worldview, believing in creation, believing in one God, believing in the salvation of Jesus Christ, will bring its own sense of distinction in this world. We were talking about this on Wednesday. We were talking about on Wednesday, we were going through our Bible study in 1 Corinthians we got into the latter part of chapter 1 and into chapter 2. And one of the things I always found that was interesting is that God uses the foolishness of this world to confound the wise. Once again, that's not simply because we wear our clothes backwards or have a mohawk or do other strange, weird things. You any strange, weird things? I'll give you one of mine then. Of course, I don't make left turns. Left turns are of the devil. I set up my entire day to make right turns. The other day, my wife and I were going. So we were going to Goodwill, and then we were going to go over to Aldi's. Aldi's was on the right, huh? All right. And Goodwill was on the left, just a little further up. She said, let's go to Goodwill first. I said, no, we need to go to Aldi's first. She said, no, 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 let's go. I'm like, you're killing me, Smalls. That's two left turns I'm going to have to make. Doesn't make no sense. I like peanut butter on my hot dogs. Anybody else ever have those? Ah, uh, you're too ashamed to raise your hands. Some of you are like, ah, yeah. Once you heard everybody else going, ugh. Try it. It's delicious. If you love peanut butter, it's perfect. Some of you think, I'll have to try that. The only thing better, I found a place that put bacon on top of that. Anything with bacon is better. Is anything. Huh? Strange things. We all have idiosyncrasies, but once again, those shouldn't be our distinction. It should be because we are lifting high the cross of Christ. It should be because we're trying to live according to the word of God and the things he tells us that a Christian should or should not do. That should be our distinction. Because in this world, no one tells them what thou shalt not do. It's open for everything against, unless it's against the law, and then even so after that. Whereas as a Christian, we hold ourselves to the word of God as our standard. Not to the pastor, not to a church, but to the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ's life itself. That is the peculiar people that he's talking about. Let it be here, God intends for us to be sanctified. It's not an option for us to be sanctified. The word sanctified, by the way, literally means to be set apart for a specific purpose. He has not called for us to do anything differently than that. 
we are to be sanctified. Let us see. God intends for us to be holy. He intends for us to be holy. I could take you a number of passages that talk about how the angels fly around the throne of heaven crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The word holy literally translated from the Hebrew literally means without sin. That's what the angels are flying and, and covering the throne of God. They're literally saying no sin, no sin, no sin. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse number 50, the Bible says salt is good. But if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Notice this next part. Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with the other. Remember we talked about how that the offering was to be given, always had to have salt. The Lord here is saying, I want that salt to be inside of you. Far too many times we change according to the will of a pastor or the will of a church instead of by the will of God. We do not expect here at Crosspoint that everybody agrees with the pastor. All God's people said. Even though I'm right, but still, I'm just throwing it out there. Huh? You need to have it in yourself. It's not something we can borrow from somebody else or an institution like a church. It must be something that we are in ourselves. Have salt in yourselves. In your everyday walk, there ought to be that saltiness, that purifying, that difference. See, what do you mean? When others are getting ready to go into recession, they are beginning to panic. Christian, we don't have a reason to panic. We're drawing close to an election. I believe that you ought to vote. If you don't vote, don't complain. I'll say that again. If you don't vote, don't complain. But you know what? It really doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter who's in Congress. Huh? I've seen people get so worked up about that. Does your Christianity shine through with just as much forcefulness? Does our life live as a walking example of Jesus Christ in this world? He intends for us to be holy. Letter D here, God intends also for us to be consistent. To be consistent. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. That you may know how ye ought to answer every man. So what's he saying? Day in and day out as we walk through this world, living differently than the passions of mankind, striving to live for that holy life between us and God, it will shine forth in our everyday living, that saltiness. It ought to every day be seasoned with that salt. Every offering, remember? Every offering. So much so, in this offering we are giving to God, we must have salt in ourselves, but it is not enough just to have it in ourselves. We need to season everywhere we go with that saltiness. Number two, and I only have two points. That's okay. <laughs> I agree. Brendan didn't write a third point, so we just got two. That's all she could come up with. We can lose our saltiness. We are to be salt, right? When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit of God, Tom, comes and lives inside of us, and he then teaches us how to live separate from this world. Not being strange, but being set apart for a divine purpose. Follow the Holy Spirit's guidance in your heart and in your life. But remember, if we're not careful, we can lose our saltiness. We can lose the ability for people to see that Jesus Christ has made a difference. Now, oftentimes people say, yes, don't go back out into the world. Sadly, can I tell you this? There are Christians who have been saved 30, 40 years and have lost their saltiness, but they're in church every Sunday. They're ornery, cantankerous, moody, huh? say mean things to people, but they go to church every time the doors are open. You've lost your saltiness. 
A little salt goes a long ways, doesn't it? You ever got a burger out of the drive-thru and they put too much salt? No? Get some fries, has too much salt? I just gave you my half of my diet, <laughs> fries and burger. You ever take a bite and you're like, ooh, that's, that's salty. Huh? Newly married, where's Caleb? Don't ever say that, Caleb, to Megan when you get married. Chew, this tastes really salty. Eh, 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 eh. That's the alarm going off. Duck. Well, we can have it where there's too much salt. But once again, we can lose the effectiveness of our salt. Matthew 5, 13, again, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It can only be used once, right? So what he's simply saying, how can you salt it again? How can you put the seasoning back into that salt? Now, obviously, as a Christian, we can draw nigh to him and allow him to give us that salt back. But if we're not careful, once again, we lose that purpose. Theologian, a scholar said this in one of the commentaries I read. It may look like salt. It may claim to be salt, but it's proof to be salt is found in its taste. Hmm. So how can we lose this saltiness? Well, letter A here, by being desensitized. By being desensitized. See, what does being desensitized mean? Let's read this passage, and then I'll mention a few things here. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. The Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Notice verse 7 and 8. And delivered just Lot. Just Lot means that he was a godly man at one point in his life. Delivered just Lot. Vexed, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Those that may not know the story of Lot. He and his wife and their children cast their tent toward Sodom. They were then at one point in the plains of Sodom. The last time we see Lot before this passage of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he is sitting in the gate of the city of Sodom and eventually loses his awful deeds, the sins that were so rampant in Sodom and Gomorrah. It vexed his soul. It twisted his soul. It tormented his soul. He knew that it was not right, but yet he lived there still. Verse 8, for that righteous man, notice this now, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Let me give you the last part of Sodom and Gomorrah. The night before it will be destroyed, the night of its destruction, two angels come into the city of Sodom. They find Lot sitting at the gate. He recognizes who they are, and he takes them to his house. And while they're being entertained there at his house, those ungodly, filthy sinners of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah began to beat upon his house, saying, bring out those two men. Bring out those two men that you've taken in. We want to have sexual relations with those two men. Of course, they're angels. Lot goes out to them, steps out the door, leaves them inside the house. And you know the first thing he says? Brethren. Brethren. Do not this wickedness. He's calling them brother. And I don't think I have to go into detail of what Sodom and Gomorrah were known for. The rampant sexuality was pervasive in every area of their culture to the point that God said, I'm going to destroy this city because of its sinfulness. Lot is calling them brother at this point. Say, why? He became desensitized. Seeing it day after day after day, it stopped really bothering him as bad 
as it should have. Stay with me, Christians. If we're not careful in this day and age, in this culture, we can lose our saltiness by living day in and day out among those that hate God and those that don't care for God, those that live against God. We can become desensitized. Now, let me just point a couple things out about this. We are all influenced by the culture that we live in. We are. You ever look at these kids and the fads they have and you think, what were you thinking? Huh? Until you realize your parents said the same thing about you. Huh? A certain amount of culture isn't a bad thing. I don't think we should go back to the Romans and start wearing robes everywhere we go. We change with the culture. But we need to be careful that we are not allowing it in our life, in our heart, to become accustomed to this. Let me give you an illustration of this. We've accepted three different things. Number one, we've accepted the fact that living together is not necessarily sinful. Well, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number one, that it is. The marriage bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. We've become to the point we accept it. Well, you know, it's not as bad. Wait a minute. 50, 60 years ago, we wouldn't have said that. But today we will. We don't want to hurt their feelings. Sin is sin, ladies and gentlemen. doesn't matter what era we're in. God intends for the sexual relationship between a man and a woman to happen in marriage themselves. It's not an option. Well, they're practically married, Pastor. It's not a big deal. They're practically married. You know, they've been together for 10 years already, have a couple kids. So it's, they're practically married. I love it when people say that to me. Marriage is just a piece of paper. I said, you're right. Let's go down to the courthouse and settle that. Oh, wait a minute. It's not just a piece of paper. And they know it. Once again, the world may do this. and It's become accepted even among celebrities, even among athletes. It's accepted even to have children out of wedlock. But it ought not to be so among God's children. That should not be acceptable. Those are new. When I do this, that means amen. Huh? We ought not to accept that. Abortion has become rather acceptable in our society. It is the killing of a human being. Now, I know it's coming up on our ballot. Was it Prop 3? Right? Read the proposition. And if you're a Christian, you will be against it. Say, why? It's a damnable thing that we are setting before our people. The killing of innocent lives. I believe that life begins at conception. Now, let me say this. If someone has had an abortion, it can be forgiven. We ought not to be ugly about it. Why? Because it's acceptable in our country. What I'm saying, once again, is, though, it ought not to be so for us as God's people. My wife and I were watching the football game yesterday, Alabama and Tennessee. Anybody else want to see that one? That was an awesome game. But as we're watching it, commercials would come up. It never fails. You'll have two guys in the hotel room. two women together in a relationship. Once again, just as much as I said marriage is necessary, homosexuality, pedophilia, bestiality, whatever the case may be, it's all sin before God. If we're not careful as God's people, we become accustomed to it because we see it all the time now. It's become acceptable in the last 10 years. Christians, you and I ought not to become desensitized we become like Lot. Day after day, seeing and hearing the things that were against God, and at the end, he starts calling them brother. Say, what happened? He lost his saltiness. How much so? He went to his married daughters. The city's going to be destroyed, right? He went to his married daughters and said, God is going to destroy this place. Come with me. And they mocked him. 
His own family, his children, mocked him and refused to come out. The only two that came with him, their hearts were still in Sodom. His wife's heart had been overtaken with Sodom. God said, don't look back. Go to the mountain. Stay there. And as she got outside the city and the destruction began to come, his, his wife could not bear it to see her loved home go up in smoke. She turned around to look, and God turned her into a pillar of Hmm, by accident? If we're not careful, Christian, we lose our saltiness in front of our families, in front of our communities, in front of other church members. When we lost our saltiness, what does he say? What are we good for? Nothing. See, my purpose and your purpose here in this world is to be salt. Salt is used to purify. Salt has a ton of uses. Let it be here. By following our fleshly desires, we lose our saltiness. You are your own worst enemy. Don't forget that. Left to ourselves, we will tend to sin all the time. It's in our nature. Let her see by losing our sense of distinction and purpose. John chapter 17, please turn your Bibles. John chapter 17, verses 14 through 19. The Apostle John writes this. Jesus Christ, this is his words, not John's. Jesus is talking and praying for his disciples. He says, I have given them thy word. Amen? <laughs> I believe I have the inspired and errant word of God today. I don't have to guess. He says, I've given them thy word. And the world hath hated them. Wait a minute. That's opposite to what we see in our culture today. The world should love us. They should love our churches. We, we, we shouldn't push it down their throat or make them feel uncomfortable. We're salt. He said, they're not of this world, even as, what's well, this next part? I am not of the world. Jesus didn't try to make himself fit into everybody's schedule. He said, my job is to be salt and light. Verse 15, I pray not that thou, speaking to the Heavenly Father, shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. There are some Christians that batten down the hatches and close themselves off, almost live in a commune-type situation, so they're not affected by the world. That is not the answer. Our saltiness is to make a difference in this world, not to be taken from it or not to be excluding ourselves from it. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's impossible for us to read the word of God and abide by its principles and then by nature not become salt in our daily lives. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be, what? Sanctified through the truth. Once again, if we are spending time in the Word of God, we're spending time in the right kind of church, preaching the right kind of things, if we spend the time in the study of the Word of God and on our knees, we will be salty by its nature. Because His Word purifies each and one of us and sanctifies us so that we are different. Last thought here, and I'll close this. I want us to ask ourselves really just a simple question. Am I living that sanctified, salt-filled life? Or are we getting as close as we can to the world without walking into it? We don't want to be disliked by our neighbors, disliked by our coworkers, disliked by our family, our extended family. So we keep that saltiness to ourselves. That is not the Lord's intent. He didn't just say, ye are salt. Ye are the salt of this world. 
That's our purpose. Not to be taken from the world, to be salt in this world. That is the difference. Are you salt? Are you salt filled? Are you sanctified? Or are we just kind of cruising along, getting along with this world, allowing the culture to influence what we think and where we go and how we live? You're the salt of the earth, right? Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, that we would recognize this simple thing. Lord, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us to be the salt you intend us to be. Lord, I myself readily admit that I am not always a salt-filled Christian that I should be. But, Lord, may you make us into that which is salty and useful. May we not lose our saltiness. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask you two questions this morning, and then we'll have a short hymn of invitation. Number one, Christian, are you salty? Have you lost your saltiness? I mentioned he's a forgiving God. But we've got to commit ourselves to him, humbling ourselves. I wonder how many today would say, Pastor, I knew I'd need to do a better job of being salt in this world. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up and let me pray for you? Amen. I'm going to make a difference in my, my sphere of influence to be salty. Amen. You may put your hands down. Then let me ask you number two. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? You can't be salty without Jesus Christ. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Oh, can I ask you? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? If you don't, he's waiting for you. He loves you. He died for you. I wonder if there'd be one here today that would say, Pastor, pray for me. I do not know Jesus Christ is my Savior. I'm not that heaven would be my home. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? No one's looking between me, me, you, and the Lord. Just slip your hand up and slip it back down. Right there where we're needed. Christian, take the time to pray. Ask his forgiveness. If you'd allowed this world to desensitize you, if in some way you're no longer the salt you were, pray. He's a forgiving God and a loving God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd watch over us. Lord, be with those who lifted their hands. May we not simply raise our hands, but Lord, may we make a difference in this world. In thy precious son's name we pray. All God's people said, <clears throat> all right, as the kids make their way in from junior church, a couple things I want to mention. Uh, go ahead and flip the slide there if you don't find mine, brother. Uh, we did redo the church mailboxes. You'll see some mailboxes on this far wall here in the uh, foyer area. If you're a regular attendee here, uh, there's a mailbox with your name on it. And I encourage you to do a couple things. Number one, glance at it every time you come into services. Uh, just go by and look at your mailbox. Sometimes you'll have things, sometimes you won't. But it can save on postage. If you want to go and tell someone thank you, write them a card, put it in there. If you're on Christmas time, put your Christmas cards in there. If I, as your pastor, need to ask you to pray for something or think about something, uh, I will leave a note in there as well. Uh, but I encourage you to check that mailbox. And from time to time, we want everybody to know something, so we'll put it into everybody's mailbox. So just kind of take a look at that. If your name isn't on there, but it should be or you want it to be, come and see me. And for $25, we'll put your name on that box, and it'll be all yours. So go ahead and next slide. Yeah, if you uh, are not on our one-call system, that's if we have uh, church closings or there's an update or we have to cancel something because of the weather, we put it into uh, our one-call system. You get a text or an email or even sometimes a phone call. Okay, so I encourage you, if you do get a phone call and it goes to voicemail, listen to the voicemail before you call me. I can't tell you how many people that call me. Yeah, Pastor, you called me? I'm like, yeah, I left a message there, but that's okay. All right, so I uh, encourage you to make sure you check your voicemail before you give me a call. Uh, but if you want to be a part of that, you can just scan that with your smartphone. It'll send it right to me. To, you can go ahead and check up that. And then uh, once again, 
if there's any kind of major changes, uh, I know we're getting into the winter weather before too long. When those things happen, we'll let everybody know via the uh, texting uh, that we have set up. Well, we're going to take our offering at this time. I encourage you to pray uh, with me. The Lord will continue to bless in our offerings. And uh, I think it's important that the tithe and the offering be given. Uh, you say, what's that? Well, we have tithes, 10% that belongs to the Lord that goes into our general uh, account, but we also, once again, do faith promise missions, something you can give towards. I know a number of people, many people actually, are giving towards our expansion fund to grow. Whatever the Lord says to do, you do that and let the Lord uh, rule in your heart. But 10% is something you don't need to pray about. It's automatically his, right off the top. Uh, but the offerings, once again, obviously are for you to do uh, to make a decision about on your own. Brother Patrick, would you lead us in a word of prayer, please? Amen. As they're taking the offering, we'll run through a couple announcements. Those that are making announcements, you want to come towards the front. I'll uh, make sure I get you the time to, to do that as well. Operation Christmas Child, November 21st, is the collection date. That's a Sunday. And I still need a couple of people that would help me with that. Uh, uh, if you would like to help with this, basically what it is, is we'll get a bunch of ta a couple tables out there. People can pick up some chew boxes. They also can pick up uh, some items they can put in their box, as well as information about it. We'll have that out next week for people to grab that. And I know that the Iwana program, I think they're still going to be involved with that this year as well. Uh, so <clears throat> I encourage you to make, make yourself available to help this. Those that may be unfamiliar, Operation Christmas Child is a part of Franklin Graham's organization where they send out these uh, shoe boxes to kids in impoverished countries around the world. Along with that, they also do a six-week uh, discipleship program leading them to the Lord Jesus Christ and then uh, starting church as many times in those areas. So I encourage you to go online and Google that, and I promise you it will bless your heart, especially watch some of the videos that are there. A um, <clears throat> couple just kind of extra things. I'll let Josh come up. I don't, what's the next one there? All right, we do have, um, this is next week. Uh, if you'd like to go to nursing homes and help, uh, we are, my wife and I usually do this, but if you'd like to come along, I encourage you to come along. They no longer have a mask mandate. So... Uh, that's a COVID-free zone, apparently. Yeah, I don't go there. Uh, but anyway, that's next Sunday in the afternoon at 2.30. Uh, a couple other things here I want to mention, but I'll let Brother Josh, why don't you come? Thank you. All right. As many of you know, um, this upcoming Saturday is Fall Fest at Fort Faith. And I know a lot of you guys went last year and the year before. This is our third year. I want to encourage all of you really to go. Um, we are planning for a huge um, turnout and uh, there's going to be multiple ways where we share the gospel and um, everyone's going to get a flyer that goes. There's a clear plan of salvation in that. We've handed out flyers to the schools and uh, almost uh, around 50 flyers to all the different businesses around. Um, we're on the news with Fall Fest. I've um, gotten chances to be able to um, they've interviewed me, and I've been able to share, um, you know, the, what, how God has blessed us and things like that in the news, and we have had so many opportunities. We are really praying for a huge turnout to Fall Fest this year, and I would encourage every one of you to come on up. It's only about 45 minutes from here. It's not that long of a drive, and it is a beautiful drive, especially this time of year. The colors were right about peak, so it is super, super pretty um, to drive up there and there will be activities for everyone to do. Um, that being said, we have a lot of new uh, activities this year. Uh, we have inflatables. We've got a carnival um, that we actually have. We're, we're renting it in, so we've got a, a company that's coming and bringing their carnival games in. Um, we've got barrel train. We've got a maze. We've got all kinds of activities and games and things to do. Um, and I would like your guys' help with that. Um, we are looking for volunteers to be able to run things like carnival games, um, the inflatables, um, even we're going to be doing pumpkin carving, so we're going to need people to help with that um, so we don't have a bunch of kids running around with knives in their hands. 
Um, we're going to need people. Uh, we've got a coffee shop that we're going to have. We're going to need people sitting at the information table in case they have any questions. Um, so we need a lot of help. So if you would be interested um, in helping out, please come and let me know. We're doing it in two shifts. It's going to be four hours long, Fall Fest all together. We're going to do that in two shifts. That way, if you do help for two hours, you can still have two hours to where you just enjoy the day and um, participate in all of the festivities. So again, if you can do that, if you can volunteer in any aspect at all, please come and let me know. Um, we will get you on there, and then uh, I would just ask you to show up a little bit early the day of. That way I can explain to you exactly what you're going to be doing. And um, the more help that we have, the better or the less I'll have to do. So that will be great. All right? Um, one more thing. We do have, uh, like I said, we're, we're having inflatables coming in this year, and we are having um, the carnival games and things like that. Um, Fall Fest is a totally free event. We do not uh, ask anyone to bring any money and we're doing that because we want as much of the community to come out so that we can um, you know witness to them and be a blessing to them um, so we want to keep that free so that families come out and do that um, that being said it takes a lot of money to put on an event like this um, and Fort Faith is a nonprofit uh, organization and we're not getting anything back from this um, I think we went we went and bought about 600 pumpkins um, just on Friday, pumpkins and gourds, about 600 pumpkins and gourds from, a, from the Amish. Um, so it is, you know, we, we, we put a lot into this. Um, if you would feel led in any way to give anything towards that, you can also bring that to me at any point um, just to help come cover some of the inflatables and rentals and things like that that we do. So if you would like to pray about that um, and any time up, to Fall Fest, or Wednesday, or even at Fall Fest, if you feel led um, to give anything towards that, please also come and um, see me uh, so that we could make that happen. If you have any questions at all, please let me know afterwards. We also have these little cards um, that if you want to hand these out to anyone that you know, invite your friends, invite your family. I'm hoping to have a huge turnout, okay? I would love to see six, 700 people there. That would be awesome. So. If you have any questions at all, invite your friends, invite your family. Again, it's a free event. Um, there's going to be stuff for everyone to do. So, um, and, and it's a beautiful drive up there. It's only 45 minutes. So I would love to see you all there. All right? Thank you so much. The pastor was signaling me to cut you off, I think. <laughs> hey, um, I'm from Thrive, the, our Thrive group. Some of you, I'm going to mention this again because we have lots of new faces, but we have a Thrive group, and it's uh, a range from about – post high school until 35-ish. We have some people with kids, so we do different things. We meet once a month. Sometimes we just do a Bible study. Sometimes we try to do fun things, but because it's fall, today we are on the schedule tonight. We're going to the Sano's home at 4053 Riverbend Drive. It was on, we do have a Facebook group, so if you are not part of that group, you can see Tom, raise your hand, Tom, over here. He's in charge of our media and so we do put announcements out on Facebook, if, or else we, if it's, it's always on the back of the bulletin, too. But tonight we're doing a bonfire, campfire, not bon. We're not tall, just small. Um, hot dogs, we got hot dogs, and we got lots of stuff for s'mores. If you could bring your own drink and bring chairs. If it rains, we are going inside, probably do, still do hot dogs, maybe games or something like that. So if there's any questions, you can see me or my husband, Steve, and... If you have some of you that are part of our group, if you have kids, our kids, as long as you keep them away from the fire, they're welcome. So we got, like I said, lots of marshmallows and stuff. So hope to see you. What time is oh, it? Oh, I'm sorry, 5 o'clock. We tried to make it early enough because I know it's school time again. Thank you. Appreciate you folks making that. Uh, have the worship team come on up, and we'll close with a song. As they do, I have a couple, just a couple reminders or things to ask. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned the fact that uh, if you see something, clean it up. Um, Pastor T's job is not to uh, do deep cleaning on things. It's basically uh, a lot of it is to help him and his family. Uh, but I'm mentioning this just as pastor. and um, I like the fact that you can get some coffee here in fellowship before we get started. But I'm going to ask you this. If you're bringing it into the auditorium, make sure you have it covered. So there are lids there that are free as well. If you bring in your own, make sure you have the lid on 
shut it off if you're not. If by some chance there is a spill, don't be embarrassed about it. Come and see me, Pastor T, or one of the ushers. We want to make sure we get it cleaned up so it doesn't stain the rest of the carpet. So I'm just asking that out of consideration. Uh, imagine you do that at your house when you spill it in your living room. You don't let it sit there and walk away. So and once again, this is the Lord's house. Please help us with that. And then also those that are in different ministries. Go ahead and stand, folks. I'm sorry. Those that are in different ministries, uh, your ministry is not finished until your area is cleaned. Okay? So uh, if you put things in different array or you have a mess, your job is not finished as a leader of that ministry until it's cleaned up better than when you got it. And so let me encourage you to help with that. just makes the job a little bit easier. Uh, I was over here yesterday uh, doing some other work, but also helping Pastor T. And so I said, uh, I'm going to make mention of this. So once again, I love you. You love me? I hope so. All right. Well, I love you too. You're like, nah, you're being dad right now. Uh, if so, half of you are grounded. But uh, anyway, God bless you. I'm so thankful to be your pastor. I encourage you once again to stay faithful in the Lord's house. This coming Wednesday, 7 o'clock, of course, we have our uh, Bridge to Recovery program that's getting started. Um, and then also I teach a verse by verse Bible study. I do have a team program. I do have a um, Awana program as well that uh, for all the ages, 6th grade and below. I encourage you to come. Plan to be here. Uh, doesn't say thou shalt come on Wednesdays, but he definitely doesn't say thou shalt not. And he definitely doesn't say you don't need it. So I encourage you to plan to come. Amen. God bless you. Oh, Jesus, after day.